Welcome back to our learning course. In this lesson, we will talk about Pavlovian conditioning and drug overdose, in particular overdose from heroin and other opioid drugs. Our goal is to relate findings about overdose to research on Pavlovian conditioning and to appreciate how fundamental research can become applied research. Before moving on, I have to stress that nothing in this lesson should be understood as medical advice. I am neither a medical professional nor a clinical psychologist, and I am not qualified to offer advice on drug abuse. To seek advice on drug abuse, use a reputable resource like a school or college health clinic, a physician over government resource like the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and you can find the link there. The main cause of death after taking heroin is falling asleep and stopping to breathe. Heroin, so to speak, puts the whole brain to sleep, including the breathing centers that usually continue to work during normal sleep. The term overdose literally means taking too much of a drug, but this is not always why a drug user dies. Long-time users are habituated to the respiratory depression caused by heroin. While a high dose can still cause them to stop breathing, their usual dose does not and it has been known for many years that many overdose victims did not take an unusually high dose of the drug. In this lesson, we will see that the cause of many overdose deaths lies in fact in how Pavlovian conditioning works. The main source for this lesson is the paper by Siegel and Ramos indicated here. Additional sources are at the end of the lesson. Already Pavlov knew that conditioning can take place in the context of drug taking. Let's look at an early experiment by two of Pavlov's colleagues, Russian psychologists Subkov and Zilov. In these experiments, dogs were injected with epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, and the molecular structure is there on the left. An injection of epinephrine given to a healthy animal increases heart rate and blood pressure, beyond what the animal needs at the moment. The brain perceived these increases as disturbances to the equilibrium of the body, and puts in place a measure to counter them. In the terminology of Pavlovian conditioning, an abnormally high blood pressure is an unconditioned stimulus, the US, and the corresponding unconditioned response is a reduction in heart rate, and consequently of blood pressure. It makes sense to use the language of Pavlovian conditioning here, because as Subkov and Zilov discovered, there are also conditioned stimuli and conditioned responses in this situation. The CS is the injection procedure itself. Within a few experiences, the animal's brain notices that being brought into a special room, being prepared for the injection, and receiving the injection all predict a rise in blood pressure. The brain then uses this cues to put in place a compensatory response that counters the effects of the drugs, at least in part. I have indicated this learning with two arrows because, as we know from earlier lessons, Pavlovian conditioning could happen in two ways by establishing either a stimulus-stimulus -stimulus association between the CS and the US, or a stimulus-response association between the CS and the response. As a test that Pavlovian conditioning had actually occurred in their dogs, Subkov and Zilov gave them an injection that did not contain the drug. In a dog that is not used to receiving epinephrine injections, this injection would have no effect on heart rate. However, Subkov and Zilov saw that the fake injection caused a slower heart rate in their dogs. The dogs were recognizing all the cues that they had learned to associate with high blood pressure, but of course they could not know that this particular injection contained no drug. So the conditioned response of lowering heart rate kicked in as usual, and in the absence of the drug, it could be clearly measured by the experimenters. Now, what happened in this particular experiment can be generalized to any drug-taking situation. For example, in the case of heroin, one of the effects of the drug is to slow down breathing. The brain senses this because a slower breathing causes higher CO2 levels in the blood and changes the blood's acidity. To bring things back to normal, the brain increases breathing rate to get rid of the excess CO2. In a person that injects heroin habitually, the brain learns to recognize the cues that accompany the injection and preemptively increases breathing rate. So any cue that is associated with drug taking can become a CS for the CR or faster breathing. So the message here is that a person's tolerance to the effects of heroin is in part a psychological process. It is not just the person's physiology, the person's body that adjusts to the drug, but what the brain has learned about drug taking is also important. 
In particular, this view of drug tolerance predicts that tolerance can fail if one removes the conditioned stimuli that the brain is using to compensate for drug effects. In fact, there is a lot of evidence that many herring addicts die after taking a usual amount of the drug, but under unusual circumstances. The idea here is that without the usual cues, the brain could not trigger the compensatory response. This table shows some data about ER admissions of heroin addicts in Spain. The reason for admission could be either a drug overdose, OD, or something else, non-OD. The situation in which the person had taken the drug was classified as usual or unusual for that person. As you can see, all patients that were admitted to the ER for non-overdose related reasons had been taking the drug under their usual circumstances. On the other hand, about half of the people admitted to the ER with an overdose had been taking the drug under unusual circumstances. This is what we expect from the conditioned tolerance theory of overdose, where a failure of the brain to recognize the usual cues of administration leads to decreased tolerance of the drug. We will talk now about three experiments that with a few variations had all the basic design. These experiments were intended as tests of the conditioned tolerance theory of drug overdose. This table summarizes the design of these experiments by indicating with one skull and crossbones a small dose of the drug and with two a large dose of the drug. Each experiment had three groups of animals, either rats or mice. Control animals were given a high dose of a drug out of the blue. This is the first line of the design table for these experiments. Animals in the other groups also received the same drug dose, but after some training. The group called different received a smaller dose of the drug as pre-training a few times before the test. The important detail here is that the small and the large doses were given in different settings, for example in different cages, say one with black walls and one with white walls. This is the second line of our design table. The two settings that were used in each experiment are indicated as X and Y. The group called the same received exactly the same small and large doses of the drug, but always in the same setting. This is the third line of our design table. This basic design has been repeated a number of times, and we will look at data from three drugs. Ethanol, the usual alcohol in alcoholic beverages, pentobarbital, a sleep medication that also suppresses breathing in large doses like heroin, and heroin itself. These are the results from alcohol. As you can see, the large dose killed almost all rats in the control group. We see that the control group deaths are near 100%. This means it was really a toxic dose. Mortality was high also for the animals in the different group, about 60%, but no animal in the same group died. This indicates that Pavlovian conditioning is an important part of tolerance. In fact, just being used to the small dose of alcohol saved only about 40% of the animals in the different group. These animals were used to alcohol, but they could not predict its delivery based on conditioned stimuli. Animals in the same group, on the other hand, were both used to alcohol and could predict that it was coming. As I already said, no animals in this group died. The story for the two other groups is similar. In the case of pentobarbital, the different animals showed practically no protection from just being used to the drug, as they died in similar percentage to the control animals. But less than 20% of the animals in the same group died. Again, very similar results were obtained for heroin. Almost all of the control animals died, more than 60% of the different animals died, but only about 25% of the same animals died. As in regular Pavlovian conditioning, even in conditioning of responses to drugs, the brain uses all available information to predict the drug effects. This also means that the brain can fail to predict drug delivery for any number of reasons. For example, the drug could be taken in an unusual place, in an unusual situation, or in an unusual way. There have been reports of overdose from prescription opioids also, just because the patient switched from a pill to a patch. Flavors can also be important cues. For example, severe alcohol intoxication happened when fruit-flavored alcoholic beverages were introduced on the market a few years ago. 
Some researchers have speculated that the unusual flavors prevented the brain from recognizing that alcohol was being drunk. This lesson is over. Here are some suggestions on what to study next. The classes on drug cravings, smoking cessation and taste aversion and cancer treatment continue the discussion of how learning research can be applied to human health. The two papers by Siegel are engaging retellings of the story of conditioned drug reactions. Happy learning to everyone!